Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'd like to also thank the, uh, the organisers of uh, Vox et des Zurich for inviting me to talk about this. So thank you for coming as well. So I'm um, going to talk about mutability and immutability and mod modifiability and unmodifiability in Java. And, um, and we'll see how that goes. So the picture, oh, so the picture there is not me, despite appearances. I'm not actually quite. I, 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 chose, I chose this guy because he's older than me. And I show up well compared to him. This is me. I have written about um, Java 5 and Java 8, the two big innovations in the Java language. I'm a Java champion and uh, Oracle ace. And I've been a Java rock star a few times. Um, the reason I'm talking here today is because the Java 5 book, the uh, generics and collections in Java, is due for a, oh, that didn't happen, uh, is due for a new edition. But, ah, here it is, yep, new edition, in Java 21, and I'm working on the collections half of that, and it's made me think a bit about this stuff, so, I've, so um, it looks to me like it's actually quite an interesting topic, and I'm going to be writing about quite a bit about it in the book, and let's see how the talk goes, and whether we turn up some interesting stuff. I also want to just briefly uh, put in an advert for um, the J Alba, an unconference of which I'm the local organiser, uh, which takes place in Edinburgh, and um, um, I'm happy to talk to people about it afterwards. An unconference is a self-organizing conference. It's quite different from this without a program. Uh, a generally much smaller, much more intimate atmosphere. We do a lot of, um, of technical talks and also, um, and also social talks and also social activities together. So it's three days. As you can see, in late June, in midsummer, we'll, the white, we'll see the White Knights of Edinburgh. And, um, and I'm hoping this is the first time we've been back in person for three years because it didn't happen in uh, 20 or 21. So uh, we still have places. So if you feel like coming to Edinburgh for three days, which you can sell as a technical trip to your, to, to, to your boss, and it costs almost nothing to, uh, to get in, then please see me or Andres afterwards because Andres is also an organizer or a disorganizer, as we call him. Today, I'm going to talk about... Um, uh, mutability, the, 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 a very rough outline of the talk, if I manage to get through it, I've not timed it as accurately as I should have done, is mutability, and I'm going to talk about what mutability is and, and why, why it's important to us. Uh, immutability, oh, okay, Where's, where are we going? Immutability, and what immutability is, because there's quite a lot of disagreement about this, oddly enough. Uh, I'm going to talk about modifiability, which is something different from, uh, immutabil from mutability, in the, uh, and modifiability is important in the Java Collections framework. And I'm going to talk about view collections, which are uh, kind of so a bit of a peculiarity of the Java Collections framework. And if I manage to get through all of that, then uh, we'll have some Q&A. Um, so... Um, oh, and a conclusion, of course. There always has to be a conclusion. So the guy, the, the guy with the long beard is Heraclitus, who was a, um, a Greek philosopher, very famous, um, uh, who appears to have known quite a lot about uh, Java. So, for example, he talked about um, certification programs. Learning many things does not teach understanding. He talked about speakers' dinners. Hide our ignorance as we will. An evening of wine soon reveals it. He talked about UTF-8 character is destiny, and he talked about streams, everything flows. But what I don't want really to concentrate on any of those today, I want to talk about the thing that he's most famous for saying, which is that nothing endures but change. So for Java programmers, change is obviously good. I mean, we live off it, really. Change is a good thing. Java programs are all about modifying uh, state. So like, it's, the, it's kind of the essence of what we do. Most state is held in collections. Collections are the vehicle for uh, the containers that allow us to process bulk data in a uniform way. So uh, modifying collection data is obviously really central to Java programming. So we're not going to be able to get away from doing that. Java is not about to become a functional language. On the other hand, change is bad. It's a bad thing because it, it, it compromises a lot of program properties that we, really, that we really want to have. If you ever talk to a functional programmer, they'll tell you that you know, we're, we're just going down the wrong line altogether because mutation is just a, a source of so many, so many evils. It, it compromises thread safety because shared mutable data requires synchronization in Java or else 
very clever coding, but generally synchronization. And that is, that is very error prone and it's also very, very expensive. It requires encapsulation. Um, because, uh, well, it compromises encapsulation, I should say, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in a, in, a, in a minute in a bit more detail, um, and the need for defensive copying. It, it, require, it compromises stable lookup in keyed and ordered collections, because if, you are, if, if you're ordering your data, or, if, or alternatively if you have a keyed collection, which is keyed on a mutable, on a mutable field, then after, the, after the, the field has been mutated, or after the object has been mutated, you're not going to be able to find it again. The ordering will be wrong, or else, the, or else the key will have, the, your key will have changed, and so you'll not be able to find the, the value you're looking for. So I'm not going to demonstrate all of these things, because demonstrating all the ways in which change is bad would actually take the rest of the talk and then some, so I'm afraid I have to take them from me. It compromises consistency of program state, because if you have variants that are uh, that, uh, um, that relate two different objects, then if you mutate one, and, and you usually do have in, Java, in large Java programs, then you have to be really careful that when you mutate one of these objects, then you have to mutate all the, the, the other or others in order, to maintain, in order to maintain the variant. And that's typically a huge source of program bugs. And it compromises simplicity and clarity because it's really quite hard to understand what's going on in a... In, in a we, this is why we have to have debuggers and why we have to look at the temporal order in which things execute. Functional programmers don't need to worry about this kind of thing at all. They don't need to worry about when something has happened. They just need to see how it's been evaluated, whereas we have to think about time as well. So all these things are, make programming harder to get right. And, uh, and in principle, right, we should uh, it's certainly if you I, I remember I've cooperated. The, my first book was written with Phil Wadler, who's a kind of who's a luminary of the functional programming world, and he just gives me such a hard time about Java all the time. So immutable objects don't have any of these problems. So it would be really nice if we could actually um, have our our uh, data structures to be immutable. Well, because change is good, we can't we can't do that. But in fact, in um, in effective Java, Josh Bloch's very famous book about um, about good Java programming, the, he recommends that even in his section on uh, immutability, he recommends that even partial immutability, as, as far as possible, reducing mutation in your program is a good thing. So when you can do, you should try to make uh, say fields final. You should try to make your fields final. You know, the, you've probably heard the saying that final is the new private because it reduces the number of different program states that you have to reason about. So if, so if, a, if, if a variable doesn't have to change, then make it final and, it, and that, will, that will actually simplify your thinking. So I, 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 said, I mentioned that I can't give uh, examples of all of these things, but I do want to talk for a minute about the need for defensive copying because this is something that people are often not very clear about and it really uh, is important to understand in order to get the difference between modifiability and mutability, or sorry, unmodifiability and immutability. So the need for defensive copying, I've, got, I've, I've made a tiny, a tiny slide here, which a tiny bit of code, which rather than demonstrating something complicated, just says, I've got, a I've got a service class, and the service class has got some important data that it wants to retain, and it belongs to the service class. But the service class is foolishly handing out a reference to it in response to, uh, in, in response to a, uh, a getter method to get important data. And then, you, then you've got a, uh, a, a client class, which either uh, maliciously or unintentionally Intentionally gets the reference to that important data and overwrite and corrupts it in some way. So th this, is a, this is a really standard problem, and, I'm, and I guess probably most people will have come across it, but I, I like to show things. I'm, I'm a diagram person. I like to think in terms of diagrams. So I so I've just kind of very briefly uh, want, to, want to show you a picture which may help to, to put this into your mind and emphasize the difference between unmodifiability and immutability. So the original array list that we wanted pr to preserve is shown at the top, and, and without defensive copying, we've given the client access to it, and now anything can happen, as I, just, as I just showed. If we make a copy of it, before we, hand, before we hand the reference back, then it looks like we're in a much better state, because now the client access is on the copy, and our original array list is, uh, is safe and untouched.
But of course that's not the whole story, because if the original array list pointed to uh, a bunch of mutable components, then making a surface copy of it is obviously going, we're all, when we copy that array list, all we're going to do is copy the contents of the array list to the defensive copy that we're handing back, and the contents of that array list are, of course, references to the mutable components. So naturally, when we give it, the client now has access to the, uh, to the copy array list, which naturally gives it access to the mutable components. So, so in other words, the, that important data structure that you had is, um, is, is, is essentially mutable by, mutable by the client. So it's a question here of whether you're thinking about simply the collection of the objects that are contained or the entire object graph that the, uh, that, the contain that the collection is pointing at. And, I mean, the, of course you can get around this in a, in, in, in a simple way. This is taken from a course I did for uh, a video course I did, and I thought, well, let's kind of go the extra way, and well, let's make improved defensive copying. So this is a picture of essentially um, a, a deep cloning of the uh, a, a defensive copy, which copies the entire object graph. And even that's not good enough because, of course, I mean, in this case, yeah, you're, yeah, you, sure, you can't get a, the client can't get at the um, at the, um, at the service classes uh, object graph. But if the if, but if the data that was supplied to the, um, uh, the if the data that was su supplied at construction of the service class was used to make this important data structure, then it may well be that the, that some client has still got access to the objects that now form part of the important data structure. And guess what? When the, um, when the, um, uh, when the client modifies the, the, um, when the client modifies one of those mutable components, the object graph that represents the important data structure has yet again been, been modified. So this gives you an idea of the, of the difficulty of ensuring that um, with, in, the, in the presence of mutation, ensuring that the client code can't alter um, data structures that are important to you. Essentially, it means making deep copies of, of the data that you're supplied with, if you're the service class, and a deep copy of, of it when you pass any references back. It's really quite a lot of work, and it's not really very nice, and wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to do it? And so we come on to thinking about immutability. So I'm, you see different definitions in, uh, in various places, in, in uh, program documentation and in books. Um, I, I, about what immutability is, but I'm choosing to take a very absolutist view of immutability for this talk anyway, and probably in the book. Um, and I'm going to say immu an immutable object is one whose state graph can't be can't observably change after construction. Now that that, that observable word is actually quite important. I'll come on to that in, in, a, in a little while. So Java objects can be immutable, of course. I mean, as we know, as we know, they, they we often have immutable Java objects, and the, the uh, wrapper classes are immutable. And hey, string is immutable, and 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 big integer is immutable. No, no, and, and of course, we often write um, classes of our own that are immutable. So one way that that. Uh, that, so there's an easy way of making sure that you, that you have written a, an immutable class. This is a cookbook approach, and it's not the only way of doing it, but, you, but, you, but if you write a class that has no mutators, that has no methods that can change the state, and it's got only private final fields, and it has exclusive access to any mutable components, then that thing is then, is then immutable. Nobody's going to be able to change it behind your back, and nobody's going to be able to use any of your methods to, to mutate it. So that's what I call immutability. Well, that's actually one way of achieving what I call immutability. What I call immutability is what's in the top bullet. It's what some people call deeply immutable, for kind of obvious reasons. So in, in effective Java, Josh has a, a fourth condition, um, which I think I might be able to... Um, how am I doing for time? Ten, ten, ten. Sorry, I'm just thinking about time, because I've got a little demonstration of whether immutable classes should be final. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a chance. So must immutable classes be final? Well, an object that's defined in the way, in the way that I just showed... Um, with those three characteristics, such an object is an object of that class 
is immutable. But there's, a, but there's a kind of a question mark over whether over the finality of immutable classes. Josh says there should be. And he's not actually, that's not strictly true, but I just want to show you a little uh, demonstration of why you might think that um, it would be a good idea to make classes that you claim to be immutable actually immutable. So abstract map has an inner class, a static inner class called simple immutable entry. And you'd think, well, this looks like it should be immutable. It's got private final uh, fields, and it's got no mutators, and it's uh, and ass let's assume, though obviously you can't you can't safely assume it, but let's let's assume for the moment that there is no external access, no um, no other uh, object has access to the keys and the values, and then we'll then we'll ask ourselves, if, supposing we had a client of that of that class. Um, like this one, for example, innocent class, I've called it, which um, uh, simply accepts a, uh, for its constructor, simply accepts a simple immutable entry. It's immutable, and, uh, and it stores that in a field, and it stores the value of that entry. It's a map entry, so it's a key value pair. So it stores the value of the key value pair in another field. And you would think, wouldn't you, that it, and it doesn't matter how many times you call check sanity, it should always return the, it, oh, that says return, but in the code I made it a, I made it a, um, um, a printout. It should, that should always be true, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should always be true, you would think. Now, let me see if I can uh, manage to find IntelliJ on this. Okay. Uh, let's turn IntelliJ. Have you got it? You haven't got IntelliJ, have you? I've got to turn, I've got to, I've got to mirror it. Uh, I knew this was risky. Ah, okay, I'm not going to manage this. I'm, I'm not going to manage this and, and still, still get time for everything, I don't think. Uh, we had a technical problem earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, so, I'm gonna, so I, I guess I'm just going to have to tell you, I think, that, um, that I've obviously set this up so that, it, so that it's going to fail. What I did was, I, it's simple, I, let's, just, let's just leave it. Um, I created a subclass of simple immutable entry, and I uh, let's hope this, this should come up now. Yeah. Am I up again? Yeah. And, and I created a subclass of, of, of simple immutable entry, and then I added a set method to the, to the subclass. The, the, the constructor for innocent class receives a reference of type simple immutable entry, but it doesn't check to see whether, that is, whether simple immutable entry is actually the exact class. It gets a, it gets a subclass. The type is correct because it, um, because, because it is a subclass of simple immutable entry, but actually the, value, the, the result of calling get value on this subclass can be something that has been mutated. So I'm sorry I couldn't show it to you, but that's but that's the idea. That's the idea behind it. So this is the reason why, from the point of view of the innocent class, from the point of view of the innocent class, it would be really nice to know that simple immutable entry was in fact final, couldn't be extended, because otherwise, otherwise it, um, the the client the the uh, innocent class could be called by a malicious client, which was actually going to which was actually going to corrupt its data. So. Uh, um, so it's not necessary that uh, immutable classes must be final, but for good API construction, you're going to want to make them. So this, this whole thing is obviously quite a pain, and being able to ensure immutability is, um, is pretty tough. People often ask, and, I've, and I quite often ask this question myself as well, could we not make it more reliable by making immutability part of the type system? Or, or even having an annotation, because in principle it looks, to, it looks as though you should be able, the, the VM should be able to actually examine a class and be able to make sure, for example, that all the fields are private and final, and that um, and that there's no um, that there's the, 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 there's no external access to the um, uh, to, to, mut to mutable components, and and so on. So the, so this this comes up quite often. And the usual answer to this, there was actually a discussion about this quite recently on one of the, on one of the mailing lists, and Brian Getz came in, because uh, he thinks about everything, he always has an answer for every question, and he says, well, you know, it kind of puts, puts the lid on any discussion, and he says, well, what about string? String has two features that make this really very difficult to, um, 
uh, to police, to, to enforce. It has a mutable cache. The, the hash code of string is lazily initialized. And so, the, and in fact, you can have two different threads accessing the string, and, the, and, one, and the, it, it looks as though the hash code the, the, um, the, the, the hash code that, that is cached could take on intermediate values. It, it looks like it's not, it's not thread safe. In fact, it is thread safe, even though, even though the, the, the cache isn't, is not even volatile. But it requires some pretty delicate reasoning to get to that. And that's the kind of reasoning which, is not, which has not yet been automated, for sure. And that's the kind of thing that, uh, that immutable objects might want to do. For the sake of performance, they might actually want to mutate their data internally. That's why, I, that's why I emphasize that, I call, that I'm defining immutability in terms of the observable properties of, of, of an object, rather than the way it's usually defined, say, well, objects just can't change. Actually, string is immutable, but it can change. It's, but, it's, it, but it can't change observably. The other thing that string has is a reference to a mutable array of characters. Well, that's not so uncommon. In fact, it's so common that, that in order to really enforce mutability, uh, immutability, you would have to have some kind of mechanism which would be able to examine uh, the references to mutable, to mutable data and ensure that there was no exclusive access, that there was no other access to them. And since arrays, which are kind of the basis of most collections most of the time, since arrays are always mutable, you're going to have to do this all the time, in effect. Um, there are proposals in the, in the pipeline for um, frozen arrays, but they're not, they're not, uh, that's, that's far in the future, and I'm not really sure that it would apply to this anyway. So, so, so these two things actually make, as Brian says, they make string into an existence proof that mutability is just too per pervasive. These are his words. Ex an existence proof that mutability is just too pervasive to contain at least for now. So that's basically what it's like in an object-oriented language. So if you can't do it with the language, maybe you can do it with the collections. Obviously, that's what I'm going to come on to talk about. <clears throat> maybe, 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 libraries can, maybe libraries can enforce it. Well, there are various options for doing this, and they've, they've been explored in, in different frameworks. Um, Eclipse, for example, has a, a, an extensive parallel uh, hierarchy, extend, uh, parallel to the... Um, to the Java Collections framework, a hierarchy of interfaces like list and set and, and so on. And it's, got a, and it's got a set of these, um, it's got a set of these interfaces which are called immutable. And got, they don't have any mutator methods on them. So, I mean, so you're kind of, you kind of think, well, that, that's really nice. I mean, and, it, and it is nice. I'm not going to speak against Eclipse Collections in any way at all. But of course, you don't have any guarantee. If you're past a reference to something called an immutable list, an, an Eclipse immutable list. You don't have, you don't actually have any, any. Um, can't, you can't have confidence that somebody hasn't just added on a mutator method to that, to, to the, to the implementation. So really, what really what effectively is happening there is that you've, um, is the, it, the design intent is indicated, and of course that's very helpful. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea at all, but it does. It, it, it's something kind of slightly, slightly deceptive about calling about calling those things um, immutable. At least, if, at least if you think that's going to be safeguarded. Guava does things differently. It's got a hierarchy of what it calls shallowly immutable classes. You probably can imagine how I feel about that, that term by now. And those are rooted in the Java Collection Framework interfaces. Java 9... Um, Java 9. Java 9 actually has always had a couple of, a couple of immutable collections. That you, that you could access from the, from the Java Collections framework ever since 1.2. So instead of me just talking all the time, can anybody think what the immutable collections were in, um, in, in JDK 1.2? There's very few of them. It's, not, it's kind of a trick question. The, uh, they, are, they are collections that are returned from the utility methods in the collections class. Empty list, absolutely. Empty list, an empty set, an empty map. Those, those are indeed, you can't, you, th those are truly immutable. I know they're not that much use, obviously. I mean, they, they're hardly, um, uh, hardly generalizable. In Java 9, there was a kind of, there was a, the, there was, um, a more modest attempt to, um, 
to get some immutability, well, uh, immutability is the wrong word, to get unmodifiability, as it turns out, into the, into the collections library. Um, and uh, the, the, the unmodifiable collection implementa implementations, they, they, un unlike uh, Eclipse or Guava, or Guava, there's no new types are defined, and they, uh, but they're just implementations. Uh, which one? The top one. Okay. Uh, they, they, uh, they, have no, they have no mutators. They have the only private final fields. Of course, they can't guarantee exclusive access to any mu to mutable components. So these, these things are, um, are the, what you'll be familiar with by now, of course, which are the, 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 the um, implementations that are produced by um, the factory methods, list.of and so, set.of and so on. So just a, f a word on terminology. Um, Stuart Marks, who implemented those, uh, the Java 9 uh, collections, and I'm going to agree with him here, do, uh, doesn't like the use of the word immutable at all if it's not, uh, if it's not actually talking about immuta real immutability. Shallowly immutable is kind of, kind of confusing. So, so, his, so his, uh, his, his phrase and the ones that are used in the, in the Java collections library are... The Java Collections Framework are unmodifiable. So unmodifiable collections are ones which are produced by these factory methods. Uh, sometimes people ask, why would you want them? Well, they're two-thirds of the way to immutability, and if partial immutability is a good thing, well, they are partially... They, they help to reduce the number of program states that you've got. They, they certainly help to provide immutability if, if, you, if their components are immutable, kind of obviously, and something that people don't often, often don't think about is, if you think about how sets and maps are implemented in, in well, in any language, they're, 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 there's going to be a considerable overhead to them. They're either going to be um, tree structures or else they're going to be um, hash structures. And in either case, there's a lot of overhead. When you have, when you have a set or a map which consists of a defined number of, uh, of elements, you can organize those in a linear way. And there's, and there's no need for... Um, and there's no need for all the overhead of, uh, of, that you get with, with, say, hash maps or, 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 or tree maps. So when should you use unmodifiable collections? When you, get, when you have data that, that at compile time you know what it is, or initialization data. So when you start running and you, and, and you, get, and, uh, you have some data coming in, and you know it's not going to change for the rest of the program, for the, for the running of the program, then you may well get considerable improved efficiency, and you may well get a much simpler program if you copy that initializing, initialized data into an unmodifiable collection. The, uh, so the, the first case is covered by the factory methods, because at compile time, you could use the factory methods to create things. The second case is covered by the, um, by the, by the uh, copying by the copy methods, which allow you to take data that's been put into a mutable data structure and copy it into an immutable one. And then you can throw away the mutable one, obviously. And stream collectors are a variation on the same thing. There are unmodified, there are uh, collectors in the, in the, in the, um, in the collector class, in the collectors class, class of, of stream, of the stream API, which will dump the, the data that comes down the stream into a, into a into an unmodifiable uh, collection. So, um, how are unmodifiable collections defined? So I'm gonna go through this one pretty quickly, I think. Um, they are, they're implementations in Java, they're implementations of Java util collection or Java util map. I mean, maybe, maybe uh, you, don't, you don't actually even know what, the, uh, what it, instead of collection, I, perhaps I should have written list or, or set. Um, because the, because they are um, they are always um, subclasses of one of those or sorry implementations of one of those. Now these interf these interfaces expose mutator methods, and so the, the in order for these unmodifiable collections to really resist modification, that is to say the uh, the, the changing of a, of, a, of the, the, their, the elements that they contain. Not, not, the, not elements that those things contain, but elements that they contain, then they, then they have to do something about the fact that uh, the mutator methods on collection and map actually can change structure. So, I don't know, can anybody guess who this is a picture of? Pardon? I can't hear, sorry. 
It's Barbara Liskov. You might, you might have heard her name because she is the, um, it's attached to the Liskov substitution principle, which says that anything that's true of a supertype should be true of objects of a supertype should be true of objects of some sub, any subtype of it. But collection.add says, I'm going to change the collection, and list.of doesn't change the collection. Uh, sorry, list, the, the, collection that you, the list that you get back from list.of when you, call, when you call the add method on that, it doesn't change the collection. It, it, doesn't, um, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't adhere to the contract of, the, of, of, its, of its interface. Well, it doesn't adhere to the contract, but the interface is the contract, right? So this is quite a big problem in the, in the, um, in the Java collections framework. Because it means that when you get a reference to a collection or a list or something, you don't know wh what the result of calling add on it is going to be. It might be that it'll work, and it might be it'll throw an unsupported operation exception. Some people think this is a kind of basic problem in the design of the collections framework. But I want to tell you that, if, that well, I, I'll actually demonstrate a little bit uh, in a moment about what happens if you try to avoid that problem. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it's possible to do it. And at least in principle, I mean, you certainly, uh, certainly the Eclipse collections go uh, quite a long way towards that uh, for the ones that they call immutable, but you'll see that it comes with a real cost. So, so the answer to the question about what is a, an unmodifiable collection in the, um, in the Java collections framework is, it's, um, it, the preliminary uh, definition is a mutator method modifies the group of objects contained in the collection. That's not necessarily the objects themselves, but the group of objects, the, 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 the set, I mean, neither the set or the list of objects that the collection contains. And an unmodifiable collection is one whose mutator methods, which try to, which try to change that group, throw an, an, uns, an unsupported operation exception. Okay, so that is unmodifiable collections, and uh, uh, Java 9 kind of gave us some pretty useful stuff in terms of, in terms of easing the, the, the production of those um, unmodifiable collections. We did have, we kind of had unmodifiable collections before Java 9, but those things were view collections. So very briefly, what a view collection is, is a way of seeing a collection which doesn't have, which generally speaking has restricted properties or maybe has different properties from the original collection. Here we've got an array list, and here we've got a, an object that's pointing to, a sub, the a list dot sublist there is another object uh, which delegates many of its methods, or I guess all of its methods, to, uh, to, to a list. So it's, because it's a view, I, uh, I put an I on the slide. And, uh, and, and, if, and if you ask the, the thing on the left, for its, say, for its first element, it will go to the, it'll go to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the backing data structure, and it'll get a value back. In this case, it gets back the, the, the one. And... Um, and it looks, to the, it looks to the observer, to the eye that is looking at this sublist, as though what it's got, any time it, it calls for, uh, for the values in the first three indices, it will get back the values that are, in the, that are in the backing array. So it looks like what it's got is a kind of restricted view of the backing array. Sublist is just one method that gives you back a view collection. There are many others, and, I'll, and the, the most important ones for our talk here is... Um, the ones that the view, the view collections that give unmodifiable views of, back, of of the backing data structure. So in this case, if I want to, if I wanted to call get on this on this unmodifiable list, I would get back the first element. That's going to work in the same way. But the but the uh, but it doesn't delegate set methods or any mutator method. If I call uh, if I call set on this unmodifiable list, I'll just get an an, uh, an unsupported operation exception back. So, so this was the pre-Java 9 way of getting unmodifiability. And obviously, it was a bit expensive because you've got to create an extra, an extra object. And of course, the, it doesn't really give un unmodifiability in the way the Java 9 one does, the Java 9 ones do, because actually the backing arrays could still be accessible by other, by other objects. So, um, so view collections give you only a, only a limited degree of protection. If you really want, pre-Java 9, if you really wanted a, a collection that was going to be genuinely unmodifiable, then what you would need to do would be to ensure that no other object 
had uh, had a reference. We, when you when you um, the, 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 there was no uh, other references existing to the backing to the backing data structure. So so that is uh, the that's the unmodifiable XXX, this unmodifiable list, unmodifiable set, and unmodifiable map in the collections class. And there are other view collections, but these other view collections are kind of a bit of a mess, quite honestly, in terms of their modifiability. So I've talked about um, collections that unmodifiable X is, is, is uh, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Oh, I'm going, I'm going the wrong way. Um, collections that unmodifiable X uh, just does return genuinely unmodifiable things. Arrays dot as list is uh, another view collection. It allows you to look at an array as though it were a list. And there are the uh, the methods on map, which will allow you to see the values in a map and the keys in a map and the entries in a map as sets. And these things all have different rules. Collections dot unmodifiable really doesn't allow modification. In arrays dot as list, you can set elements, but you can't add or remove any. And in the case of these, the the ones to do with maps, you can remove them, but you can't add them. And there are more corner cases and more different rules. So view collections apart from the, um, the unmodifiable um, methods in the collections class, these view collections, generally speaking, you probably don't want to be trying to modify them unless you can learn these rules. So, um, to conclude, Stuart, likes, Stuart insists on riffing on Schopenhauer's law of entropy. Schopenhauer's law of entropy is not, was not by Schopenhauer. I've got a picture of him as well, because I like pictures of old people. They make me look good, better. Uh, it's not, it's not a law, and it doesn't have anything to do with entropy. But aside from that, it's a, it's a, it's a good rule. If you think um, about immutability as wine and mutability as sewage, um, if you, you can make a, an object graph a little bit immutable in a corner, but you're not going to get any of the properties that uh, you're going to still have all of those bad things happening that I talked about early on. If you put a spoonful of sewage in a barrel full of wine, in other words, you've got a, 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 an object graph which is almost entirely immutable, but you've got one corner of it is mutable, you still don't get those, you still have those bad properties. So basically, mutability is either, it's a, it's a wholesale thing, either you either are or you aren't. So I said, shallowly immutable is like a little bit pregnant. You can't be a little bit pregnant. Only, only shallowly immutable doesn't have a Netflix series to go with it. So, conclusion, design is always about trade-offs. The Java Collections framework has got a bunch of problems. You, you have to do defensive uh, uh, copying, you have to do synchronization, you, you've got unsupported operation exception, and you end up with a library with about 30 types in it. And that was one of the real guiding principles. This is a really important design principle of the Java Collections framework. It's, uh, Josh thought it's going to be used by millions of programmers, and a lot of them aren't going to have time to spend, to spend studying a collections framework. Let's make it simple. Uh, the, an intermediate case is, the, is, is Guava. Guava still has unsupported operation exception, so it's a little bit like what the, um, the Java 9 um, un, um, unmodifiable lists are like. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very capable library, so there are other, problem, there are other many other features in it as well. It's about 10 times as large as the, as the Java Collections framework. Eclipse goes the whole way. So the Eclipse library has... Um, has Immutable, uh, an entire hierarchy of immutable, of immutable collections. And it's, and it's also got a lot of other things as well. And it has about, by my count, about 3,000 types in it. So there's no way you're going to learn that in the same kind of way as you'd learn the Java Collections framework. You, it just requires a different approach. The, dis, the discoverability of, of classes and interfaces in there is quite different. And you really can't use it without, it, without an IDE. So, I mean, according to, according to um, my, my thinking, well, actually, none of these are bad. And it's good to have choices. They have different design criteria in mind. And they, they're, 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 it's all about trade-offs. So I hope in this talk I've given you some idea of what the choices are that you, that you have with these different frameworks and with others that try to handle this problem of immutability. And ho I hope also I've may, maybe given you some idea of the pitfalls that, immut that mutability in object-oriented programming keeps in store for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice. Uh, we have time for one or two questions, if there are any in the audience. Let me get, let me get out of this light. Let's see, oh. let's get out of the... Uh, oh, any thanks. questions? 
Such a relief. Well, I've stunned them all. Here we have. Ah, good. Oh. So you mentioned um, generics uh, in Java 21. Uh, can you? Is there something new coming for collections as well in future versions of Java? Um, no, I think most most of what I'm in, most of what I'm expecting is going to go into the book. And I, I, you kind of got that the wrong way around, really. I, um, the generics part isn't. There aren't huge alterations in, for Java 21 unless Project Valhalla comes to comes to fruit by then. So that's kind of in the balance, and uh, the publication date may may shift on that basis. But there's there's actually been over the over the over the years since. Well, the Java Collections Framework came out in, um, in 1998, uh, an age ago, and the first edition of the book was published in 2006. And actually, in the 16 years since then, there's been a lot of experience about, about the Collections Framework. And, and the, uh, one of the things I'm really looking forward to doing is putting a, a design retrospective into there to show, like, I mean, Josh did a really good job on the Java Collections Framework, but we have found things that maybe could have been done differently and some, and some kind of time bombs that, that, that were left in there. So I'm, I'm, and there have been changes as well. I mean, quite aside from these things that I've talked about, there's been quite a lot of enhancements to the Java Collections Framework gradually over the years. And so a new edition is really, is really needed for that. And of course, streams, which, are, which kind of, uh, um, uh, cooperate with collections very closely. So I want to put some stuff in about that too. Thank you for the question. <laughs>